training post Budapest has been pretty good. Um, we didn't really know leaving for Budapest. We weren't really sure what the restrictions and things were going to be like coming back um, six to eight weeks later. But um, when we did come back, we had to do our two week quarantine. So I actually had to go to a different province in Canada and, and I was there for two weeks before I could come back to Toronto where I'm currently at and where I currently train. So it was a bit of a um, detour, but um, we made it back to Toronto and um, have been training. Yeah, just training since Canada's still in uh, quite a, a lockdown, but I'm fortunate to be in the pool and be in the weight room. So that's all I can really, um, you know, be thankful for. So. Of it's course. good. Have you been out of Canada since? No, I have not. Wow. Kylie, what stage of the season are you currently at in terms of Tokyo 2021 preparation? Are you kind of hitting the hitting the workouts hard, sort of in your building up the base sort of period, or are you more focusing in racing now and getting the details intact? Yeah, so in Canada, we've been in pretty strict lockdown for a while, so we don't have any competitions um, available to us. Um, so we've been managing by just doing suited efforts in practice, and we have kind of like meets within our training groups. Um, there are a lot of people in the country who still are out of the water, so the numbers are are slim and with restrictions again it's hard to like get people together to actually race but um having said that like i'm just training training hard right now and we fortunately i was pre-selected to the olympic team so that gives me a bit more flexibility to, to continue my hard block of training and not have to be super super prepared for um the end of may when we have our qualifications but um I still want to, you know, be able to swim fast at that at that meet. But knowing that I'm already pre-selected to the team is is a big relief, and it gives me a bit more flexibility with just the design of my training and um, preparation leading into that meet. But yeah, all in all, I'm just just been training and um, taking it day by day and week by week, and preparing for whatever we have that comes that comes next. Makes sense, Kylie. Do you feel at all like you're at a disadvantage? having not many meets leading up to Tokyo compared to some other swimmers right now. Um, do you think you're going to have a, a little bit of pool rust or is that something that doesn't affect you? Um, I mean, I'd be lying if I said I didn't think about that. I think it is, it's, it's really um, prevalent in our minds now, especially the closer and closer we get to the end of the summer. But um I think like it's nothing that I can control and, and it's nothing that even like our federation can control. It's like from the government and, and the rules for our country with restrictions and, um, you know, what we're able to do as a community in a country. So um, I know that I can't control and I just have to take whatever opportunities I get to race and um, put stuff together and put, put my races together as best I can in practice. And um, that's all I can control. And, I think we've done a good job and I'm thankful that my coaches and support system here have, um, you know, mimicked the environment as best we can and getting into race suits and just doing like some races in practice and doing races like on the weekends within our training group in order to emulate just like that racing environment and to try and give us that race when, you know, we don't really have competitions per se. Makes sense. Kylie, there's been a, practice adopted by some of the U.S. colleges during this COVID period and hosting um, online dual meets. So yeah. pretty much a um, couple of colleges get together, they all swim their events just in their home pool, and then they compare the times online and see who's the winner and so on. What do you think about this format? That's really cool. I think that's super um, adaptable, and I think that's amazing that um, programs are doing that. I think it's really you know, it's just an extra like motivation and, and stimulation to some fast, like seeing someone else's times and um, trying to beat that. So yeah, I think that's a great idea. Thank you, thank you, Kylie. Kylie, looking ahead of Tokyo 2021, um, what events are you actually gonna focus on? Is it just gonna be backstroke or are you gonna throw in some freestyle in there, maybe even some fly, I don't know. 
<laughs> um, I don't know. Post 2021, we'll see. I think um, I in in university, I swam a lot of different strokes. I did do fly and I did do free and I did IM for a little bit while I could. But um, and I did enjoy doing other events. So um, I think it would be cool to try something out. I think I would have to put in a lot of work and kind of go back to the basics on some of those um strokes to um you know build that up again but i think it would be fun to try something else but i i have no idea <laughs> i'm kind of focusing on the next couple months and then um after that we'll we'll reset fair enough um have you been solely focusing on backstroke somewhere around starting 2015 right Without yeah so yeah so i i came to when i came to toronto to go to school to swim with the university of toronto i I wasn't actually recruited as a backstroker. Like I said, I swam like fly, I swam free, I swam I am. Um, and I kind of did a mix of everything in university for our dual meets and for our like university national championship. And then um, in 2017, end of 2017, I had a little bit of a knee injury, which stopped me from swimming breaststroke. So after that, I haven't been able to swim breaststroke since. So I am was out of the question, unfortunately, but um, I was able to continue to do fly and free um, for the varsity program, but I never really, um, you know, I never reached that internationally or, or nationally even with, um, you know, the national team. But yeah, after 20 in 2015, in the summer of 2015, when I made the 2015 University Games team, I made it in back in the 100 backstroke. And that's kind of where I saw um, the most success and the most improvement. And then that summer, um, when I won the FISU in hunter back, I, I think I kind of realized at that point, like, oh, wow, like, maybe you know, backstroke's my thing and maybe I should stick to backstroke. And then ever since then, I kind of have stuck with it. And um, again, here and there, I've swam different things varsity, but for the most part, backstroke. Makes sense. Thank you, Kylie. You know, it's interesting. Chad has somewhat of a similar story, I want to say, because Chad mm -hmm. started off as an IMer, And the only reason he started doing focusing solely on fly is because he injured his knee and he couldn't oh. do breaststroke. <laughs> That's funny. Kylie, <laughs> um, the field in female backstroke right now is extremely dense and strong. Um, what, in your opinion, is going to separate the winner at Rio from the rest of the field? Yeah, I don't know. The field is so deep and so talented. And I think it's incredible to have such a, an amazing field of, of women in that in backstroke and um i find it really inspiring and motivating to be amongst them and to be pushed by them and um i think it will be an exciting you know race regardless but um what would step i don't know i think it's just because it's such a sprint i think the small details in the race will obviously help um if you nail those but then i think just like back end speed coming home I'm not sure. <laughs> Fair enough. Kylie, what do you think about the 50s in the Olympic Games? Do you think they should be introduced? Um, I don't know. I feel like I've gone back and forth on this one. I think um, they are really fun to swim, and I do enjoy swimming 50 back. Um, I don't know. I, I really sit on the fence with this question, and um, I'm not really sure, but I think – the meat is like really long already and so adding more races is just going to make it longer and i don't know um i like i think it's manageable and i think it's definitely like possible but i'm not sure you know i don't know personally if i would i think depending on the schedule obviously but um yeah i'm really not too sure on that one <laughs> Fair enough. you say the meat is a little bit too long already what about the semifinals? Do you feel like semifinals actually have a place in the sport or should it be just time, time prelims and then straight to the final? And that would free up a lot of time and potentially more events could be added, maybe even the skins. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think semis are great. I think it's, it's another 
opportunity to show, you know, really who, you know, who can win in the final if you have to progress through the prelims, then the semis, and then to the final. I think it is challenging having only the semis at one meet per year because I don't think, because I think it's just something that we're not as used to. But um, I do, I do like the semis. I think maybe for longer events, it's always a bit harder for like 200 and up to have prelims, semis, and finals. But um, yeah, I, I, I do enjoy having the semis in there. Fair enough. Thank you, Kylie. Kylie, how confident are you that the Olympic Games at, at Tokyo are actually going to take place? I'm confident they're going to take place. I know that there are many people working tirelessly behind the scenes um, to make that happen. And um, I know the COC, the Canadian Olympic Committee, is working so hard to ensure that um, we as Canadians are going to get there safely and um, responsibly. So I, I'm, I'm confident that they'll go ahead. I know it will obviously be a completely different Olympic Games than what it was before. Um, and that what it will be in the future. But I think given the circumstances and, and knowing what we've experienced this last year, I think we knew that um, it's going to be different no matter what. Thank you, Kylie. By the way, um, you don't have to reveal anything too much, but have you been given any letter from the IOC already potentially on, on, on the format of the Olympic Games or maybe the safety protocols or nothing yet? Um, not that I know of. I, I've just been given what the, I think what everyone's, what's been released to the media and stuff. That's all I've seen. And, um, what's come from our Canadian Olympic committee, which I think has come down from the IOC in terms of the playbooks. But, um, other than that, I don't really know too much. And to be honest, I kind of just focus on what I can control and what on and what I, you know, I can, what I do in training day in and day out because nothing else is going to change. Thank you, Kylie. And that's fair enough. And that's a very resilient approach, um, focusing on the stuff you can control and sort of leaving the rest out of the way. That makes total sense. But Kylie, um, sort of taking our attention away from the Olympic Games and coming back to the ISL season, um, how would you analyze the performance of Toronto Titans in Budapest 2020? Yeah, I think we did fantastic. I think it's so hard to come into a environment and a group of teams who are already established. And I know a lot of those teams, you know, had people come and go. So they weren't the exact same team coming into season two as they were in season one. But having a completely new team with many people who had not competed in the ISL before, um, I think that's a large challenge to overcome just in terms of like confidence and um, just the dynamic and, and how everything flows even with the, the format um, and how quick everything goes. I think um, it's, it's just totally different than what we were used to. So I think as a new team coming in, I think we did so well. I think we really bonded together quickly. And I think the bubble format obviously helps that because we were with each other all the time and training together. And that, you know, that obviously wasn't the case in season one because it didn't need to be. And we all flew in for the meets and flew out. But um, I think as a whole, as a team, we did awesome. I think we were extremely strong. I think we have so much room to progress and to um, get better and better. 100%. Thank you, Kylie. Kylie, you, you, you kind of already touched base a little bit on you guys being the rookie team, but there was also another factor that played in the bubble. Um, you guys came into the bubble later than all of the other teams. Do you feel mm -hmm. like that played a role at all, uh, the, how the season played out for you? Um, I don't think so. I think everyone's schedules were, I think like everyone had a tough schedule. And some people had, you know, the first two meets close together and other teams had, you know, the later meets close together. So I think in the end, it all kind of did even out. But um, I, I I don't think coming in a week later was a disadvantage. And I think um, if anything, it I think it made it a bit smoother because the teams were already there and everything was kind of figured out. And we just kind of slipped in and uh, did our thing. 
Oh yeah, you guys missed the Wi-Fi struggle. We didn't have any <laughs> Wi-Fi for the first couple of days. <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> True. Kylie, but what about your own performance at ISL 2020? Um, what do you think of it? And did Coach Byron McDonald have any feedback for you um, after the after the season ended? Yeah. Um, so I was happy with my performances. Obviously, coming off of COVID and quarantine and everything i think when we got to budapest it was super interesting to talk to everyone from all over the world and see you know who had been out of the water for long and what people were doing and um everyone's answers were all over the map and some people had been out for a week some people had been out for four months and everyone was all over the place so i don't think i i really knew what to expect for myself but at the same time i know from the training that i had done um i was swimming well and I was, you know, swimming fast in training, so I was hoping to get close to my best times or do best times, and um, to have done that, I was really happy, and just to work on some small details that I kind of was able to get back to and work work at throughout COVID and through the quarantine when, when we still had restrictions and, and limited pool access, so um, yeah, I was happy with it, and, and Byron obviously being there was super nice to be able to connect with him and for him to watch my races live and and give me the feedback. Thank you, thank you, Kylie. Was was Coach Byron overall happy with your performance? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think he was. I was close. I was swimming. I think for the most part, um, the fastest I'd swum since 2016 when we had short course world. So um, as a, it was the fastest I had been short course for a long time and. Um, I think, yeah, he was, he was happy with it. Thank you, thank you, Kylie. Kylie, I kind of wanted to ask about your sort of personal relationship with Coach Byron, because I've had a bunch of podcasts with different coaches already, and one of the answer questions I ask is, what do these coaches think about the interaction between athlete and his coach? And is there sort of possibility for friendship in there? Or would it sort of inhibit the overall the overall cooperation of the two? And every single coach said we should keep it professional. Friendship is good, but there should be a boundary between the athletes. Coach Byron kind of took the same position, but he was a lot more open to it. And he kind of ended up with saying that, yes, for some athletes, it is possible to be friends with their coach and yet still be successful. What do you think regarding all this? And if you're fine, sort of telling us a little bit more about your relationship with Coach Byron, what is it? Are yeah. you more friends? <laughs> um, I don't know how, like, I wouldn't know. I mean, I think we're, we're definitely friends, but he's also definitely my coach. I think it's important for there to be a boundary and kind of a balance between that coach and, and friendship. But I do believe that coaches – should have a good um, relationship with their athlete because especially at an international like high performance level where your career is your your swimming and um, you obviously have major goals for yourself. I think it's important for a coach to know a little bit about what's going on in your life outside of swimming just to help with um, training. Like if you're having a really bad day, like a simple example, if you're having a really bad day and um, or, you know, something happened in your personal life and, um, then you had to come to practice and like, for the most part, you'd like to, you know, leave that at the door when you get into, when you walk into the pool, but that's not always the case. And for a coach to understand that and be understanding and recognize that you have a life outside of swimming as well, as much as swimming is your sport, you also are a human and, um, you know, things happen. So for a coach to like know those kind of things and be able to react and, and work with you on, you know, even just um managing that training set if if your day was really bad for example so i think it's important to have that coach friendship balance um i do believe to keep it professional but i also don't think there's a problem in in being you know friends and knowing you know a bit more about someone and you know how they tick and their personality because i think that could only benefit the relationship um with the coach Makes sense. Thank you, Kylie. So just, just in other words, let's simplify this a little bit. Um, when Coach Byron gives you a hard set or maybe a set that you don't particularly 
feel like doing this day, there is negotiation power on your side, right? Well, no. Okay. <laughs> not, <laughs> not at all. I'm saying in like circumstances that don't happen every day, you know, like if something were to happen and um, I think it's just important for a coach to be understanding and to have that open communication with a coach, especially at a high level. Makes sense. Thank you. Kylie, um, Marcel Jerry is another athlete that trained with Coach Byron and won, bron won bronze medal in Barcelona in 1992. Do you guys know each other? And did he offer any advice to you prior to Rio 2016? No, I don't, I don't, I don't think I've ever met him. Um, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure I haven't ever met him before. Maybe, maybe this, this could be a person to meet. It's, it's interesting yeah, you guys for sure. share, share a serious background. Thank you. Yeah. Um, another, another topic we discussed with coach Byron was, um, he has a very interesting point of view on short access turns. I don't know if you've discussed this with him, but what he basically says is that the rule regarding touching the wall with two hands should is it's um, a little bit, how would I say this in a, in a polite way? It's, it's outdated a little bit because he says it's not possible to measure how, when did the second arm touch, you know, what, what, what was the difference between the two? And no, no judge sits there with a, with a stopwatch measuring to the hundredth of a second when the two arms touch. What is your opinion on this? Um, do you feel like the rule regarding this should change? Maybe it should be a one arm touch. Maybe just the two arms should touch at one point, but it shouldn't be simultaneous. Um, I mean, I'm going to be really honest with you. I don't really spend a lot of time on my front doing those sorts of turns. So Fair enough. Um, I'm not really, I don't think I really have a stance on that. And I'm not, I'm not too sure how I feel about that one. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you. Another interesting technical um, novelty that exists in swimming right now, let's put it this way, that I wanted to discuss with you is the breakout of Kira Toussaint doing backstroke. She kind of does that front pull at first, almost like she's doing a freestyle pull, and then she gets into her backstroke. What do you think of this? And do you potentially see yourself adopting this in your own stroke? Yeah, I had not seen it before until this ISL. Um, I And I was like, wow, like I was really amazed that it could all happen that fast. And I think I... I don't think I tried it at ISL. I remember kind of like thinking about it and thinking like, wow, that that's going to be really hard to coordinate together um, underwater, but I have not tried it yet um, in training, but I do think it's obviously a really unique way of doing a breakout and it, it clearly works for her. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if more and more people do adopt that. Um, but yeah, I haven't yet tried it for myself yet. Fair enough. Thank you, Kylie. Kylie, what is your pre-race mental preparation and what is your typical mental state prior to a race? Pre-race, I, I like to keep it light. I like to um, kind of distract myself a little bit, sometimes with music or like talking to friends. I find that just keeps the environment a bit more light and normal. Um, obviously still focused, but I, I think I do enjoy a little bit of a balance of keeping it light because I think if you're just, well, personally for me, if I'm just super focused, I just get, would get too nervous and, um, be, and sorry, what was the other part of the question? My mental state, your mental state prior to a race. Like I, I know some people sort of zone out and the best races happen to them when they don't think about anything pretty much. Some people, yeah. you know, think of this as their Hail Mary, their last stand, and their life depends on it. You know, everyone takes it differently. And I was just wondering, what category do you fall into if you do? Yeah. Um, I think I kind of just zone out, like I said, and, and keep the environment light and just kind of think about whatever comes into mind and, and just drag myself a little bit away from the actual race that's about to go down. Um, just to keep the nerves at, at bay a little bit, but, um, yeah, so I would say a little bit in between of, you know, happy and excited, but also nervous and. Makes sense. Do you suffer from insomnia pre-read? Um, no, 
not yeah. not usually um sometimes but not like detrimentally no <laughs> Do you have any tips how to how you battle that anxiety if if you start developing it prior to a race, or is it just something um, I I kind of cheated a little bit prior to this podcast? I watched your social kick podcast, and I, I know you mentioned that a lot of it comes from just your preparation prior to the meet and your self confidence in, in your work. Is there any other other tricks you use or other maybe mental tools you take advantage of? Um, yeah, I think just like visualizing a little bit, just like visualizing myself doing the race and knowing that I can do it. And um, I think just like breathing, like just kind of bringing everything like back down to yourself. Like, cause I feel like when you're, when I'm before a meet, like behind the blocks, I'm like up here. So <laughs> I feel like taking a breath and like, like telling myself to calm down and relax is like a way of like bringing myself back to within and just like focusing. Um, so yeah, I think probably just trying to calm myself down and focus a little bit and visualize a little bit, but um, not be too, too focused. I think there's a, a balance there for me. Makes sense. Thank you, Kylie. Kylie, do you do any psychological work outside of the pool? Um, yeah, like, I mean, I think all the time you're working psychologically on yourself I think um especially over quarantine I realized like how much physically I train but also like how much mentally we need to train as well and um I think I kind of do it subconsciously I think just continuing to stay positive um is a psychological tool I think just keeping perspective um those sorts of like little things that I don't think I actually realize I'm doing, but I am, I think are important psychological tools that really help me. Um, and then, yeah, just, I think like a little bit of meditation here and there and um, mm -hmm. reflecting a little bit. Makes sense. Do you do any visualization? I wouldn't say outside of, of training no, or, or competitions, but, um, like at training a little bit and, um, competitions. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you, Kylie. Kylie, um, do you follow your diet closely and do you follow a specific diet plan? Um, I mean, I definitely follow my diet closely in the sense that I ensure I'm getting all the proper nutrients I need and, um, I'm fueling myself to proper performance and, you know, fueling my body to be as strong and fast as I can be. Um, and that's done in, in help with like a dietitian. But um, I also believe in, you know, everything in moderation. And I do um, believe that a happy swimmer is a fast swimmer. So I think if that, you know, whatever, you know, if I feel like having a treat or like doing having takeout or you know I, I'll do it I I don't I think we train so much and um you know we burn so many calories like I don't I don't really focus too hard on um restricting myself or anything so Taco Bell Friday evening is not out of the out of the picture occasionally <laughs> uh, occasionally yeah I mean, Taco Bell isn't my go-to but <laughs> sense i was i was just trying to come up with something something of a fast food place but thank you kylie kylie what about your sleep schedule are you um how much do you typically focus on sleep do you nap during the day and how how important is it in your in, in your performance in general yeah um i think sleep is so important and i love sleep i've always been a sleeper <laughs> um and i and i really do believe and I and I know that sleep is so so important for recovery so I I really do try to stick to a good sleep schedule I have trouble napping during the day I find it a bit harder to shut my brain off during the day and I kind of have this weird thought that if I have school or something I'm like okay I if I do my school during the day or in between practices then I'll just be able to go to bed that much earlier at night 
So then I feel like if I try and nap during the day, all I'm thinking about is, oh, well, I have school to do or like I should do this right now. And then I feel like I can just never fall asleep during, during the day. But um, it's gotten a little bit better over the years, but uh, I still do have a bit of trouble napping. But I, I recognize that sleep is so important and I love getting a good solid night's sleep. Makes sense, thank you. Kylie, um, living in Canada, when you go to a big international meet, it almost always requires you traveling across the globe. How do you deal with jet lag? Um, that's a good question. I honestly think each trip is so different. And obviously, depending on where it is, it's, um, you know, could be many, many hours away, could be not that far away. So I think I am accustomed to traveling frequently and traveling a lot and having long travel days. And I think um, for me, it's important before leaving to kind of get on a good just like making sure my body's rested and making sure I'm getting good sleep so that I'm not um, giving myself any chance to get sick during like the long travel days or during the days when I would have less sleep with jet lag. So I think the lead up to the travel is important and that's something I try and focus on. Um, also too, is just like preparing before I leave like a couple of days, like making sure I pack everything. So I'm not scrambling like the last couple of days running to like the grocery store or running to pick up last minute things. Um, Cause I think that's just adds stress and that stress can obviously compromise your immune system as well. So I think before the travel is important and something I focus on to help the travel and be prepared for the travel. And then um, for the actual travel, I think just um, obviously making sure I have everything I need and I'm comfortable and um, trying to sleep on the plane if it's an overnight and we get there in the morning, just trying to get as much sleep as possible. And then when I usually get to a new place and with the time change, I try and adjust right away. So usually when we go to Europe and we erupt, it's usually like an overnight flight and then we'll arrive there during the day. It's like, okay, we'll stay up as long as we can for as long as we can to like be on the time zone. And then usually that works. It's really hard, I find, to make yourself stay up. <laughs> I have a really hard time doing that. But I'm always thankful that I do because then, you you know, you may only wake up at 5 a.m. as opposed to, like, being up at 2 a.m. So I think it's all about just, um, you know, obviously where you're going and adapting to that time zone. But I try and just get on the schedule or the time zone as, as quickly as I can and, um to, to stay on that and like stay off my phone. If I, if I do wake up in the middle of the night, um, to just like force myself to try and go back to sleep or to just lay there, um, as opposed to actually getting up and starting the day. So I think just little things. Makes sense. Thank you, Kylie. And I have great admiration for you because I'm one of the people that arrive to a new place, get the jet lag and then fall asleep for 24 hours or so, wake <laughs> up and then, I have a big problem in front of me. <laughs> um, but Kylie, um, let's take sort of a trip down memory lane and a big trip down memory lane. Um, and Kylie, what pulled you into swimming? How did you start? Yeah, so I started, um, well, my mom put myself and my siblings in swimming lessons when we were really quite young. Um, she wanted us all to learn how to swim. She grew up like with a cottage. So she was always swimming and she was like, this is a life skill I want you guys to have. So she put us in swimming lessons. And then um, we also did a summer swim league out of like my town's pool, like out of my community pool, which was like a summer league, which was just throughout the summer months. And we were really young, like we were probably three, four, five, and six um, kind of age. So it wasn't really necessarily about the swimming. It was just, you know, we were swimming and, um, you know, we did it with some family friends. So it was more of an activity. And then I did that for a number of summers. And then I really, did enjoy swimming. And so I decided I wanted to be able to do it year round. And that's when I looked into um, joining a club team, which is what I did then when I was 10, was when I joined the Windsor Essex swim team. And um, that's when my competitive journey, I guess, started. Obviously, I started in a 
in the lower group. And then as you get older and you progress, you go through the groups. Um, yeah, and I, I just really enjoyed being in the water. I loved swimming. I loved the social part of swimming. I think that's kind of what kept me in the sport for a little while was just um, I had such a great group of kids that I was swimming with and I loved going to practice. I loved like seeing my friends and we all went to different schools in the area. So it was like coming to swimming after school and like seeing a whole new set of friends. And um, I, I think that's honestly what kept me in the sport there for a while when um, it was just happening a couple of times a week and um, we were just doing it for fun and doing it for activity. So yeah. And then just kept building off of that and um really just enjoyed enjoyed the sport and enjoyed being in the water thank you do any of these amazing friends still swim yeah a couple of them do a lot of them have retired now but um there's still a couple of them that do that are a bit younger than me oh, that's amazing um kylie do you remember this specific moment when you said boom i want swimming to be my professional career mm -hmm. I don't think so. I think graduating in grade 12, I knew I wanted to swim in university, but I wasn't necessarily at an international level yet. And I wasn't, um, you know, I wasn't really sure I, I could do it as a career, but I knew it was something that I wanted to do in university and I wanted to continue to try and improve at. So I know that was kind of the first step, I think, in, in, taking swimming a bit more seriously was like deciding I wanted to go to university and swim, be a part of a team. And then that's what, what led me to U of T. And then I think a further step after that was making the, you know, my first kind of senior international team when I made FISU and kind of realizing like, you know, this is, there's potential here and um, you know, this is what I want to do. Makes sense. Thank you, Kylie. Kylie, what actually motivates you in swimming? Um, I've chatted to a bunch of athletes now, and people seem to fall into four main categories. It's people who like the athlete lifestyle, people who love the thrill of competition, people who have like that strong intrinsic desire to win, to prove that they're the number one at at least something in the, in the entire world. And the fourth category is people who just purely love the, the action of swimming. They love being in the water. They, they, they just love the activity. Do you fall in one of these categories or are you maybe a mix of all of them or maybe you're something else? Yeah, no, I think I definitely fall within a couple of those categories. I do love being in the water and I love swimming, but I also love competing. I think um, I, I love racing and, you know, training day in and day out isn't always fun, but um, the racing is what really motivates me and um, just the desire to continue to improve and to be the best and the fastest swimmer I've ever been is so prevalent in my mind. And that's something that, um, you know, I want, I want to do day in and day out. So um, I do love, I love racing and um, I also love pushing myself and trying to get better and better. Thank you, Kylie. Do you enjoy um, practicing and just grinding in the pool in general outside of competition? I mean, I think, yeah, obviously to an extent, I think um, there's definitely days where I don't love it. Um, there's definitely days that are, that are hard and harder than others, but um, you know, you have to go through those, those days to, to get to the competitions and um, yeah, training training day in and day out is is hard and the competitions are the fun part, but in order to get to the competition, you have to do the hard work and you have to do the training. So um, it's just all part of the process, I guess. Thank you, thank you, Kylie. One last question before we get to the blitz portion of this podcast. Um, Kylie, how important is the team aspect in your swimming motivation and performance in general, because you, you, you had quite a bit of um, team activity, let's put it this way, in your swimming career, maybe a lot more than um, some of the other swimmers, especially not from US or Canada. Um, you, you obviously were a, a member of a university team, then now you're a member of the to Toronto Titans. Um, 
How important is that team aspect in, in, in your swimming career? Yeah, I think it's so powerful. I, I think often we forget like swimming is an individual sport, but it's a team sport as well. And I think having a team around you who's encouraging and supportive, I think that just helps the individual even more. And I think the environment you're in and the people you surround yourself with, aka your team, is so important because they can really create that that successful environment for an individual. So I do believe that team is so important and I do really value having having a team and having people around you with similar goals and um, you know, who can push you and you can push them. Makes sense. Out of pure interest, what is your ideal teammate? Someone who's swimming against you or with you? Well, that's tricky. I mean, I don't know. I think a bit of both. I, I've had both. I have both. So I think it's, um, I don't know. I, I like both. <laughs> if that's an answer. That's a fair enough answer. Thank you so much, Kylie. And with that, let's move to the blitz portion of this podcast, if you're ready. Yeah. So here we go. First question from the fans. Do you have a pet? No. I okay. wish. <laughs> if you if you were to have a pet, which pet would it be? Dog, um, cat, lizard? Yeah. If I could, I would have a dog, for sure. Okay. When I'm older, I'll definitely have a dog. <laughs> fair enough. How, what is your average yardage per day? Um, on average per practice, I would say five and a half K. Makes sense. Thank you. What is, what is your personal preference? Long course meters, short course meters, or yards? Um, long course meters. Long course meters, fair enough. What is your favorite event to swim? The hundred back. What is your favorite event to spectate? Ooh. I like the two and a three. Fair enough. I like that one a lot too. It's, a, it's an interesting one. Yeah. You, you almost have a guarantee of somebody dying at the end. It's, uh, <laughs> Interesting in that regards also. <laughs> um, bouncing off from that, Kylie, um, how many siblings do you have? And um, are they brothers, sisters? Could you, could you reveal that a little bit? Yeah, I have an older brother and a younger sister. Okay, thank you. Um, how old were you when you started swimming? You mentioned three, four, five, and six, but... Yeah, I started competitively when I was... 10, I joined a club. So I, I typically say 10. Fair enough. Kylie, who was your childhood idol if you had one? Um, I feel like I had so many. Um, within the sport of swimming, I mean, obviously Michael Phelps. I also really enjoyed watching and looked up to Natalie Coughlin. And, um, and then as I got a bit older and was kind of immersed in our Canadian system and our, our nationals I was attending, we, I, I got to see a lot of the Canadian Olympians. So I, I did really look up to them. And um, those people were Hillary Caldwell, Ryan Cochran, Julia Wilkinson, Heather and Brittany McLean, a lot of like 2012 Olympians. Cause I think that was more when I was, I was more invested in the sport and I, um, you know, wanted wanted to be like them. Makes sense. What about outside of swimming? Um, outside of swimming, um, who else? You don't have to overthink this too hard though. If, if, if there's something <laughs> that pops into in, in your head, that's totally fine also. No, I mean, there's definitely so many. I just, I can't even pinpoint one right now, but the Williams sisters, um, yeah, I'd say the Williams sisters. Sisters. Okay, that makes sense. What a career they had also. Very uh, a very interesting when someone shines so bright as a star, but yet has a very long career. It's, it's truly mm -hmm. admirable. Yeah. Bouncing out from that, Kylie, what is your favorite sport to spectate outside of swimming? 
Um, I mean, at the Olympics, I love watching gymnastics. I love watching track and fields. Um, I think on a day-to-day basis, like sports-wise, I'm a really big hockey fan, so I like watching hockey. Um, I played soccer growing up, so I do enjoy watching soccer quite a bit as well. Finally, a Canadian that loves hockey. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're the first to mention this. <laughs> really? Yes, I, I was amazed also. Um, what about what about um, in, in gymnastics and track and field? Do you have favorite events? Um, I mean, I love watching the sprint events in track. I also love watching the 800 and 15 meter um, or 1500. I, I, it's cool now, like knowing some athletes in the, in those events and kind of seeing them over the last couple of years. And I think the 800 and the 1500 are similar to like a mid distance swimming where it's kind of like uh, an endurance race, but also kind of a sprint. <laughs> um, so I think that it's cool to watch because it's similar to like the 200. Like I think there's so much strategy and like tactic in it on um, when you kind of kick um, and when it, when you're holding back. So I, I find those really entertaining to watch. It makes sense. Um, what about your favorite sport to take part in outside of swimming? Um, I would probably say hockey or soccer. Fair enough. Wow. <laughs> um, Kylie, what was your college major? Kinesiology. Sorry, I, I, I missed this. That's okay. Kinesiology. It's, Kinesiology. it's like, yeah, it's like human kinetics or exercise science. It makes sense. And um, last question for the for the Blitz. Um, what is your favorite team logo in uniform, counting out Toronto Titans, obviously out of the um, ISL roster of teams? Okay. Um, so any sports team, meaning? No, 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 no. Only only ISL teams. But hey, oh, okay. let's let's extend that question. Um, any any <laughs> team is or, or also involved. Um, this is kind of interesting. Um. Well, I love the Toronto Maple Leafs. So. Um, that's the logo I would pick. Um, Canadian Maple Leaf, Toronto Maple Leaf. So I have to go with that. But within the ISL, the best logo, um, excluding the Titans, I'm trying to think. Um, I like the Tokyo Frog Kings logo. Yeah, it's a good one, and especially their team um, team activity that they do, the team yeah, sign, the, the Tokyo Hop. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, so well. I had to pick that. Of course. Thank you so much. And um, ladies and gentlemen, this was Kylie Moss for you. Kylie, thank you so much. And before I let you go, uh, I wanted to give you the word and maybe you have any final words to your fans or maybe to the fans of Toronto Titans. Yeah. No, thank you very much for supporting and um, hopefully see you in season three. 100% season three is happening. It's coming up soon, (laughs) less than half a year. I know, crazy. I know, it's madness. (laughs) You you probably have the same feeling as me that the time is running out, but there's a lot more things (laughs) that we need to prepare, right? (laughs) Exactly. But Kylie, with that being said, thank you so much for making it to this podcast. It means a lot to me personally and to all of our spectators. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. And to all of you, all of you watching, um, our next podcast will take place this Wednesday. Please tune in. And thank you so much for being with us. Have a great whatever time of the day is at your